Welcome to the Little Italy, Arkansas Heritage Museum. As you entered this room, to your right are the 15 families and five bachelors who founded Little Italy. Become familiar with their names and faces because they serve as the main characters in this journey. On the opposite wall, you will see a picture of immigrants arriving at Ellis Island. But our journey does not begin there. Rather, it begins in Italy during the 1860s. Italy as we know it today did not exist until 1870. Though Italian culture and food is far older, a united Italian state is actually a century younger than the United States. At approximately the same time that many of Little Italy's founders were being born, their homeland was in turmoil. A failed attempt at democracy created a more severe situation economically and socially for most Italian peasants, and as a result, between 1880 and 1920, millions of Italians left their home bound for the United States or South America. Beginning in the 1890s, the founding families of Little Italy began their exodus. Many arrived in large metropolitan areas such as Chicago, while others, such as Domenico and Antonia Zuppo, settled at Sunnyside Plantation in Arkansas. While still others, such as Pietro Carlotta and Luigi Carraro, immigrated first to South America. One common experience among all of the founders was the experience of the Immigrant Processing Center located at Ellis Island. Like 12 million other immigrants, our founders arrived after two weeks travel aboard a steamship and were processed by immigration agents. The new arrivals were subjected to a myriad of tests, both physical and psychological, to prove their worthiness of immigration. Luckily for us, all of Little Italy's founders passed these tests and were admitted. IQ tests, delousing, painful eye inspections, and intrusive physical exams were endured by the peasants. You may try your luck with the feature profile test developed to test IQ among illiterate immigrants at Ellis Island. This test and its key are found on the table in this room. Once the immigrants passed the exam, their confusing Ellis Island experience was not over. Next to the Ellis Island board, you'll find Italian currency like that used by our founders prior to their arrival. At Ellis Island, the immigrants exchanged such currency for U.S. dollars, usually with terrible exchange rates. Other processing items such as an Ellis Island inspection card and immigrant ID tag are found on the door next to the currency. Once they departed from Ellis Island, a majority of our founders arrived at Chicago. Here they found conditions equally poor to the conditions they left in Italy. Poor wages, dangerous jobs, and filthy living conditions concerned the new immigrants. By 1910, many of the families became concerned that their children were becoming influenced by the violence and crime which surrounded them in Chicago. They sought a way out, a new life, and now our story turns to Arkansas, to the American South where the Italians believed their American dream could be attained. This would be their new land of opportunity. The immigrants learned about land for sale in Arkansas from advertisements in local Chicago newspapers. The Arkansas Lands Company brokered land sales for the Fouche River Lumber Company, which owned approximately 45,000 acres of land in Perry and Pulaski counties. When the Italians saw these advertisements, they were intrigued by the possibility of establishing an agricultural colony in America. Prior to their departure from Italy, most of the immigrants lived on farms, so they were familiar with the agrarian lifestyle. Immigrant colonies were relatively common in Arkansas in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Communities like Altus, Stuttgart, and Tonytown were founded as agricultural settlements. Thus, Little Italy's founders continued this practice when they settled here. Originally, a small group of men ventured to Arkansas to see the land before purchasing it. 
Upon their arrival, Joseph Bellotti, John Segala, and Antonio Buzzato were astonished to find that the rugged hilltops and mountainous terrain of this region resembled Italy. They felt the establishment of a settlement here was possible and returned home to begin the process of moving. Working with land agent Martin Galden, the men purchased land and began making arrangements for travel and housing. Joseph Bellotti ordered a house to be built, and it would be in this house where all five families would originally dwell. The property on which this museum sits is part of the original 80 acres owned by Bellotti. On the 22nd of December, 1915, the immigrant families boarded a train, and within a day they had arrived at the nearest depot to here, a small town along the Arkansas River called Ledwidge. At Ledwidge, the Italians were taken in by a foreman for the railroad, and shortly thereafter, they arrived at their property via horse and buggy. The men, women, and children, and all of their possessions arrived at the Bellotti House on December 23, 1915, just two days before Christmas. The four small panels ahead describe the settlers' initial thoughts upon their arrival at their new home. Down the hallway to your right, you will find ship manifests and various postcards which depict the ships on which the Italians voyaged to America. Also, you will find an Italian letter which describes the contents of the household the Chero family left behind after departing Italy. Ahead, you will see two signs describing what little Italy was like before the Italians arrived. Details about Arkansas's indigenous Quapaw tribe who occupied the land before European colonization and more information about the Fouche River Lumber Company. Next, we'll proceed to the gallery to the right. Above the doorway, it will say the Bellotti Vacari Memorial Gallery. You are now in the Bellotti Vacari Gallery. As you enter the room, directly in front of you is the first picture of Little Italy's founding families. Represented in this photo are the Bellotti, Segala, Buzzato, Granado, Perrin, and Chero families. The families are situated in front of a sign which reads Alta Via, Arkansas. Alta Via, or in Italian, the high place, was the original name given to this area by its founders. Notice the clear-cut trees in the background. This is how the region looked after the Fouche River Lumber Company harvested virgin forests shortly before the families arrived. The Alta Via sign is flanked by American flags, and directly below the sign is the flag of the Kingdom of Italy. The immigrants are visibly proud of their American success, while also keenly aware of the home they've left behind. On the panel to your right is the original land advertisement seen by the immigrants which prompted their move to Arkansas. Almost immediately, the local newspapers in Little Rock took note of the good things happening here. Especially noted in the press was the establishment of vineyards by the Italians. The immigrants toiled endlessly to turn their rugged, rocky soil into suitable terrain for their grape crop. During their plowing, they turned up countless rocks, and with mules and wooden sleds, they gathered the rocks and built miles of rock walls to terrace their sloping land. While focusing on their grape crop, the Italians also tended livestock, planted large gardens, and struggled to sustain their families. While many early residents also established lucrative businesses in Little Rock, on the panels above the display case are two such instances. Entrepreneur Domenico Zuppo established a hot tamale stand at 15th and Main in Little Rock. Zuppo brought this knowledge of tamale making from the African American and Mexican American influence which surrounded him at Sunnyside Plantation. John Segala opened a horseradish factory at 8th and Center in Little Rock. 
and James Chia establish a restaurant on Markham. While a majority of Little Italy's residents focused on grape growing, several men took on a variety of jobs to help make ends meet. They worked on the railroad, became stonemasons, and laid terrazzo marble floors. The residents of Little Italy worked tremendously hard to attain success. Men, women, and children were expected to work hard, and they did. Just as their grapevines were reaching maturity and yielding fruit, the federal government ratified the 18th Amendment, which prohibited the production and sale of intoxicating beverages. The immigrant farmers now faced a difficult decision. Produce grapes for sale as table grapes only, or continue with their plan to produce and sell wine. Now this would be illegal. So they compromised and chose both. In this room, you will see many interesting artifacts in the display case. Items related to the purchase of land, such as an original land receipt, articles from the Fouche River Lumber Company, as well as an original horseradish label from the John Sagala Company, original passports, a 1915 timetable from the Chicago and Rock Island Railway, and Native American arrowheads uncovered when plowing fields are exhibited on the display counter in the room. Now let us continue our tour in the next gallery to your right as you exit this room. The sign above the door will read, John and Lucia Sagala Memorial Gallery. You are now in the Sagala Gallery. This gallery focuses on the cultivation of grapes in the colony, as well as the production and sale of illegal wine and cognac during Prohibition. Prior to and during Prohibition, the winemaking Italians of Little Italy raised hundreds of acres of grapes and boasted four wineries which produced thousands of gallons of alcohol yearly. In the vineyards and orchards of Little Italy, everyone was expected to cultivate their crops to ensure the markets they supplied received quality produce at reasonable prices. Like a cooperative, the farmers guaranteed their mutual success through a common goal of commercialized vineyard operations and mass production of wine. This pooling of the farmers' resources made it lucrative for companies to send freight cars to nearby Ledwich for loading and shipping of the colony's goods, which included more produce than merely grapes. By the mid-1920s, 35 rail cars of grapes, 30 cars of peaches, and 10 cars of apples were shipped each year from Little Italy's farms to surrounding markets. The grape harvest took approximately three weeks in late July and early August to complete. During that time, all members of the family were required to participate in harvesting the crop. During the growing season, the vines were sprayed four times with a fungicide to prevent mildew infestation. The fungicide, called Bordeaux mixture, contained an insecticide called arsenate of lead, copper sulfate, lime, and water. The vines were sprayed before budding, before blooming, and twice after the grapes formed. Two weeks before harvesting occurred, the final spray was applied, which contained a cleansing agent of fish oil soap mixed with other additives. During the spring, the air in Little Italy was filled with the scent of the small white blossoms that bloomed from the grapes. Outside of the busy spring and summer months, the vines required little attention. Though there was always work to be done, and everyone was expected to chip in. Concord grapes were the most common variety of grapes found in the local vineyards, but other varieties were grown as well, but in lesser quantities. The two large panels to your right as you enter the gallery explain in further details the work required for the grape harvest. Additionally, several primary sources from newspapers of the time report about the conditions of grape growing in Little Italy. In the corner of the gallery, is a large grape scale used by the Sagala family to weigh and process their grape harvest each year. It was on scales such as these that all Little Italy's vineyards weighed their grapes for sale, 
shipment, and production of grape into wine. Shortly after the ratification of the 18th Amendment, people throughout the country began consuming poorly produced alcoholic beverages. Often these beverages were produced with wood alcohol, a substance similar to turpentine, which for those who consumed it would often cause paralysis or death. Newspapers across the country were filled with headlines reporting hundreds of cases of death after the consumption of the tainted elixirs. But because of the master winemakers at Little Italy, Little Rock's newspapers only reported one death at this same time. The residents of Little Italy provided a tremendous service to the people of central Arkansas. Each weekend they supplied clean, reliable, alcoholic beverages to the state's largest metropolitan area and helped Arkansas's politicians avoid an alcohol-related pandemic. During Prohibition, Little Italy was a bootlegger's oasis. In conjunction with the support of local politicians, Little Italy's residents operated a booming business, which centered on the production and distribution of wine and cognac within the community and to larger areas such as Little Rock and Hot Springs. The major producers of Little Italy's alcohol were Bertolo Balsam, Sperandio Gadotti, John Segala, and Jolindo Solda. Though the other residents produced wine for personal consumption, these men conducted full operations, including distribution via automobile to larger cities. During this time, Little Italy earned an infamous reputation. As local officials poured resources into the area's roads, the improved infrastructure promoted ease of travel and increased tourism. The draw of tourists to the colony provided the residents with an economic boost, but also increased the overall crime and rowdiness of the community. To help maintain law and order, Jalindo Solda was deputized as a Pulaski County Sheriff's deputy. Solda is pictured to the left of the entrance into this gallery, circa 1930. In this image, Solda stands in front of his tavern with his holstered pistol and sheriff's badge. Behind him is a sign which reads, Wine for Sale. This photo was captured in the midst of prohibition and illustrates a conflict of interest, an officer of the law participating in the violation of federal law. Solda's relationship with Governor Carl Bailey is a special note in the community's history. Carl Bailey served as prosecuting attorney for Perry and Pulaski counties in the 1920s. It was at this point when he befriended Jalindo Solda. Bailey would frequent Sola's tavern and winery, and as he rose through the ranks of Arkansas politics, the friendship continued. By the mid-1930s, Bailey became Arkansas Attorney General and made national news when he arrested and extradited mobster Lucky Luciano in Hot Springs, despite a $50,000 bribe from the Mafia. Bailey was in Little Italy when he received news of Luciano's arrest and headed along with Solda to Hot Springs to ensure the state police's role in the seizure of Luciano. The small panels to the left of Solda's image memorialize the role of Little Italy in Luciano's capture, and more information about Bailey can be seen on the display ledge in this gallery. Now we will exit this gallery and turn right. We will enter the small gallery on your right. Above the door, it should say, Vincent and Annunziata Cero Memorial Gallery. You are now in the Vincent and Annunziata Cero Memorial Gallery. As you enter the room, turn left. This gallery focuses on the merrymaking and personal lives of Little Italy's residents. Visitors flock to Little Italy from all over the state, and while enjoying the alcohol purchased here, visitors and residents alike gleefully dance to the accordion music at Cero's Dance Hall, played by Little Italy's orchestra. Or they joined in an intense game of bocce at one of the community's four public courts. In addition to music and dancing, Little Italy's young men formed a baseball team, which traveled a circuit of towns nearby and hosted games here as well. In an era before radio or television, the residents of Little Italy occupied themselves with a variety of activities. Women sewed, gossiped, 
played traditional Italian card games such as Trisette or Briscola, while the children swam, hunted, horseplayed, or studied. Men often drank and wagered on intense bocce games. The bocce set in the center display cabinet in this room were used at the Vacari Bear Joint in Little Italy, a hub for visitors and locals alike. Children attended school at the Ledwich Schoolhouse, which was situated about a mile from the community. Due to needs on the family farm, boys typically made it through third grade before leaving school, while most girls went through the eighth grade, some even on to high school. Certificates and report cards from the Ledwidge School can be seen on the walls of this gallery. Portions of the exterior siding and flooring of the school are also on display. The food culture of Little Italy was another important aspect of the community's identity. Women often cooked meals quite different from their American counterparts. Handmade pasta, bread, and polenta, which is a cornmeal mush, were staples of the diet here. During the summer, fresh vegetables were important foods, while in the winter, pigs were slaughtered to produce sausage and suppresse, which was stored in the cellars. As we exit this room, you will see two images of Little Italy's children, circa 1924. Notice their clothing, the cigarettes, the pipes, the alcohol bottles. Notice how happy they look. As you exit, turn right and enter the largest gallery. On your right, the sign above the door should say, Ambrosio and Angela Vacari Gallery. As you enter this gallery, directly ahead of you are typical utensils and food preparation tools used by Little Italy's women. The large rolling pin, polenta board, and polenta paddle were used in the kitchen of Carlotta Carraro. The immigrant women produced their family's food, but as the community's notoriety and popularity increased, the desire for Little Italy's wine and food also grew in demand. As a result, beginning in 1927, Little Italy began hosting the Grape Harvest Festival, an event which has attracted nearly 100,000 people to Little Italy since the first festival in July 1927. Women produced hundreds of pounds of pasta for the event and served the Italian fare to the festival goers, which has become a key event for politicians. Candidates such as Joe T. Robinson, who headlined the first festival, and President Bill Clinton have joined hundreds of candidates in the yearly pilgrimage to this event. For years, the festival offered rarely seen foods, music, movies, campaign speeches, in addition to the community's chief commodity, illegal alcohol. The event has been hosted on the grounds of St. Francis Catholic Church each year since 1927, and we invite you back to Little Italy in October for this year's festival. In addition to hosting Little Italy's festival, St. Francis Catholic Church, founded in 1922, has served as the community's center for a century. Before the church was completed, services were offered at the Ledwidge School. In the early years of the church, due to the importance of the production of alcohol, St. Francis received direct pastoral assistance from the office of the Bishop of Little Rock. Because of its importance, the community was protected by the highest levels of local government and by the Catholic Church as well. The Bishop of Little Rock sent the priest who served as his personal secretary to offer services here between 1920 and 1936. One early priest was Father Albert Fletcher, whose only pastoral assignment during his time as a priest was at Little Italy. In 1946, Fletcher became the fourth bishop of Little Rock. He continued a close relationship with the people of Little Italy whom he once pastored until his death in 1979. The deep Catholic faith of the immigrants was manifested in the sacraments of the church. Baptism, First Holy Communion, Confirmation, weddings and funerals were all important events in the life of the community. The homes of the Catholic Italians were filled with symbols of their faith, and each family took active part in the life of the church. St. Francis was originally built in Ola, Arkansas, as St. John the Evangelist, but it was purchased and rebuilt here in Little Italy. The original structure was deconsecrated 
and in 1969 it was replaced with the current church. The celebrations in Little Italy were also tempered by tragedy. Similar to most early 20th century communities, fire caused death and destruction here. Rino Buzzato died at age four in a home fire in 1922, and Joseph Bellotti, the community's founder, died in a gasoline lamp explosion in 1929. Three years earlier, the electrocution by lightning strike deaths of father and son Lorenzo and Fulvio Buzzato in the community cheese house precipitated the establishment of St. Francis Cemetery, donated on land by John Segala. The cemetery is located a mile west of this museum and is the final resting place of most of Little Italy's founders. Though none of Little Italy's servicemen died in World War I or World War II, those conflicts compelled many of the community's young men to fight. The young men from Little Italy served their country valiantly in both wars, while in the midst of World War II, many of their parents were under investigation by the government due to xenophobia and the classification of Italians as enemy nationalities. Documents relating to Annunziata Cero and Pietro Carraro's immigration status can be seen in the display case and on the rear wall of this room. The photos of these servicemen can be seen on the large panel on the rear wall. In addition, the story of Angelo Bellotti, who served at Pearl Harbor on the day it was bombed, can be seen on this panel as well. Our modern Little Italy is one of a legacy that is enduring. The families who founded this settlement over a century ago risked everything to come here because they recognized that this little place held the promise of their destiny. The modern 21st century residents of Little Italy have not allowed the passage of time to lessen their love, awe, and respect for this place. Instead, the descendants of the original settlers have sought to solidify Little Italy's role in Arkansas history. The people of Little Italy are proud of our heritage. This museum is a key example of the resilient spirit of those who live here and how we will never allow this little place to be forgotten. Thank you for visiting. You are now a part of our continued history. We welcome you here as family. It is our hope that you never forget the resilience and fortitude with which this historic settlement was founded. And we bid you, Bona Fortuna, good luck. This concludes our tour. Before you leave, we ask that you stop in our museum gift shop in the next room. Your purchases and donations help us maintain this museum and provide us with funding to continue our mission to educate our visitors about Little Italy's amazing history. Thank you for your support. We hope that you have enjoyed your time with us today, and we thank you for your visit.